live from the Agricultural Park of Columbus, Nebraska. This is Columbus Today. <laughs> it's also not wishful thinking. It's not wishful thinking. Sorry. Live from the parking lot of Sprouts here in Sacramento. We're on time today. And Constance wants to tell you all about her spinach quiche. I do not. But, but she won't. <laughs> Lon, she says, Lon says, just tell them the recipe for your quiche. You don't have to measure or anything. I will not. That would screw me. Uh, <laughs> but you will dictate dictate it to me someday, right? Someday. Oh, someday oh, over the rainbow. <laughs> <I'll do that. laughs> when oh. we get back to Costa Mesa. Oh. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um... I hope you all made it through the week. We had, uh, an, it's getting colder here, and we had an exciting Sunday. We had a, a, a brief extreme downpour, and water started coming into our closed windows on two sides of the house because our gutters have not been cleaned out yet by the landlord. But it's really too early in the season, so we're first on the list, they said. But anyway, it was not good. I had to take everything out of the pantry yesterday because that's a, it's a bathroom and the window even with the windows closed. It was like, a cloudburst on steroids. Yeah, and it just... It came, it, uh, over an inch of rain in 40 minutes. Really? Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was pretty awesome. Uh, don't want it to happen again, ever, like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm running with towels around windows. And it was, a, it was a cleanup and not really fun. So I'm starting to think, oh, it's only going to be like that for the next seven, eight months. <laughs> <laughs> the terror of winter. I, I always vowed I'd never move to a place where I had the terror of winter, and here we are. Anyway, well, that cheers me up. That, that's too bad. That, <laughs> Didn't cheer me up either, because I was the one out in the, I ran out in the rain with screwdriver <laughs> yeah. to pull the screens off of the windows so at least it would drain out a little bit, and, and got completely soaked, and I was that way for about an hour. Anyway, uh, but, you know, it's like, I, you know, it's just, the way it is, I've survived it, and I hope we all survive the winter. I'm sure we all will somehow. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't have anything particularly wonderful to say except I'm grateful. I'm going to talk <laughs> I'm grateful about your though, I'm grateful the mess is cleaned up. That's yeah. what I am. So I so yeah, clean I, up a mess this week. It's I, that time of year. It's like fall cleaning instead of spring cleaning. So clean I, up a mess. I like your lumberjack look today. Um, I do have to go out and do more lumberjack work, but not. I don't dress like this when I'm. I dress in sweatshirts that have parts of them worn off, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and give, <laughs> anyway, so um, have a good day and a good week. Clean up some mess on every any level of your being. That's what I'm trying to do this week so, to get ready for. Extra cold. It's kind of almost freeze. I think this week. It's almost so. Halloween. I know the moon was beautiful last night on my walk. I take walks in the dark, and it was hazy and very beautiful. And there's a lovely. There's a place that has a. The Halloween decorations are out. They're not too elaborate, but there's one place that has bushes with netting of uh, purple and orange lights and little balls all over it. And then at the top of their house on the second story, like a balcony area they have. Instead of a snowman, it's a three-level pumpkin thing. This is so dumb to talk about. And it plays the Monster Mash over and over again. It was louder last year, but I think it must have driven the neighbors crazy in the church across the street, too. But I stand there, and it's so beautiful and so awesome. And I, have must, I don't know why that song brings back. It's so stupid. <laughs> a good feeling, or anyway... I start to pray hearing the monster mash at the Halloween display last night. So, and my I realized Boy, that that's, three that's hardcore, I know, that's, desperate. that's hardcore witch. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and on the way home, to the monster. And the way back from there, three blocks later, I realized my cheeks hurt because I was smiling so big. So oh. those people would, you know, they have a love. I think they have like a three or four year old who probably likes that. I'm anyway. a jolt for my electrode. I don't, even know, I don't even know all the words. It's just a good earworm, I think, this time of year. Anyway, have a good week. Clean up a mess on some level of your being. 
I'm going to clean up a mess on some level of my being. <laughs> okay, are you going to get po polenta making stuff? I already have polenta in the pantry, because I, I know I do, because I, I found popcorn yesterday in there that I forgot I had, so that was my carrot at the end of the stick. I made this popcorn at a really late in the afternoon, and it was very naughty, and we ate a big bowl of popcorn about two hours before dinner. <laughs> and you just pop it in the in the kettle, oh, right? Oh, well, yeah, I saw it on the like, stove. Like, well, it's anybody can do normal, that. normal popcorn. It's organic popcorn. Okay. <laughs> okay. Corn has to be organic. Uh, okay. Can you release me? Okay, you are released. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and here I am. Thank you, dear. Uh, the monster match. The monster match. Well, anyway, yes. I will. I will be in there and maybe bump into you as soon as the show's over. I'm looking for my mask because I wear a mask when I'm in there, and I seem to have misplaced it. Well, as much as she wouldn't. Uh, she wouldn't cooperate this morning with with her. I don't her... have it memorized, and I haven't made it in thirty well, years. Well, I'll maybe not that long. I, I sort of uh, uh, sort oh, of winged oh, it a oh description Lord, of it. Oh Lord, don't believe so, what he says. So this is this is the recipe here. So. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, today I'm going to talk about. Uh, because uh, the other day we, um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, when talking about initiation and uh, the Manly Palmer Hall uh, book, uh, uh, Lost uh, Keys of Freemasonry, uh, Constance is wandering around the parking lot uh, aimlessly. I wonder what her problem is. Uh, I don't know. I hope she's not having a, a fit of some kind. <laughs> no, she's just heading for. If she is, you'll you'll see it live. Okay. All right, I, I, talking about the uh, astral uh, projection, or actually, we were talking about the terror of the threshold. Uh, in an initiatory experience, and and I brought up the the. Uh, sort of uh, uh, system of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, where where uh, levels of of consciousness are uh, are, uh, are are protected at each uh, at each uh, shift in higher consciousness. It's sort of protected by a, a, an ordeal uh, or a fear that must be overcome some some way or. or or tricked into letting you into that that level of consciousness, and uh, in the what does all of this have to do with quiche? Uh, well, some of you already know if you've read uh, Low Magic. It's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. Uh, and I'm not going to read read the whole chapter on. Uh, uh, Astral projection, traveling in the spirit vision, or real magicians eat quiche. But I'm going to jump into because I it's an amusing story and uh, sort of a Halloweeny kind of uh, kind of thing. I'm going to jump in and kind of in the middle. I wish I could say that I'm a skilled astral projector. I'm not. Oh, I get out of my body quite often, and when I'm out, I'm pretty skilled at controlling my movements and the circumstances of the vision. But only rarely do I consciously initiate the experience. When I do, it's always in that golden moment, at bedtime or nap time, as my thoughts are just beginning to take on visual dream forms. But while I'm still conscious of the fact that I also have a physical body slumbering on a real bed. 
This moment is characterized by a, a strange noise that I seem to hear, not with my ears, but in the very center of my brain. Then an intense feeling of an electrical current passing through my entire body. I'm going to digress here for a second. When uh, I first, uh, at a swimming pool, at a public swimming pool, when I first got the, the courage to jump off the end of a three meter uh, diving board, I didn't dive, I just jumped off. When I stepped off the edge of that board, my body, my physical body dropped, but it seemed like I was following about, <laughs> about three feet behind it. And the I that was behind my body had this wonderful ecstatic thrill. And the thrill was centered in the uh, very, I would think in my solar plexus uh, chakra. It was, but it went, uh, it was happening in my physical body too. And that's that, uh, that intense electrical current I'm, I'm talking about. Also, when I uh, uh, grew up and, and started to uh, fly regularly, take uh, regular airplane trips, uh, I uh, really enjoyed the takeoffs. And I always I liked to sit by the window. And as the, the plane goes faster and faster and faster and faster down the runway, and then it finally has a burst of acceleration and the nose goes up and the plane goes into, into the air. My, I am riding about 20 feet behind the plane. Okay, it's, it's almost like I'm being stretched and my physical body is the the anchor to the to the me that's being stretched uh, on the runway, and I have that same electrical feeling. Well, that's the feeling I'm talking about that I get after I hear that funny little noise, and I find myself laying in bed inside my body. That current is actually the body we might call the astral body. And the fact that I'm feeling it is the signal that my conscious self is about to take residence in it. At that fragile moment of transition, I'm nestled uncomfortably within the general vicinity of my physical body. It is at that moment that I can transfer my consciousness from the I'm in my bed body to I'm in this buzzing electrical body. At this point, I can get up, wander around the house, which always looks just a little different than the material house, or take a diving jump into the air and fly straight through the ceiling into the glorious sky. On most occasions, out-of-my-body experiences begin without a conscious effort on my part and within the context of a dream in progress. I become conscious within the dream state that I am dreaming and already out. I then become consciously aware of my situation and take control from there. I partially achieve this state when I experience magically induced altered states of consciousness such as when I purposefully induce a trance in order to scry into tarot cards or the Enochian tablets and squares. Most of my projections, however, are those in which I find myself accidentally out, wandering only a few yards away from my snoring body. And this is the story of one such adventure. I wish I could tell you there's some great magical lesson to be learned from this tale, 
perhaps there is, but mostly I'd like to simply illustrate some of the strange and interesting characteristics of these experiences, and in doing so, encourage you to fearlessly start your own program of exploration. Before I begin, however, I need to share a strange and often terrifying occurrence that often accompanies out-of-body experiences, and which I believe has since time immemorial been the cause of all manner of religiously motivated nonsense concerning demons and devils and ghosts and vampires and the torments of hell. We might call this phenomenon the terror of the threshold. The dynamics of consciousness that e explain this phenomena are, however, anything but terrifying. In fact, I believe when the facts are properly understood, they are very interesting and at times downright funny. A few moments ago, or earlier in this uh, chapter, I described the ancient Egyptian concept of the self of the deceased progressively passing from lower to higher levels of consciousness during the death experience and how at each new level the mind creates an escape pod for the essential self of the individual. These temporary shuttlecrafts are also bodies formed from progressively finer and more subtle energy material. Yogic literature identifies these various bodies as astral body or etheric body or causal body or mental body or emotional body. These subtle bodies do not necessarily need to be created and cast off only by a person who is dying. Indeed, our thoughts, desires, and emotions are constantly in the process of creating and discarding them over the course of the agonies and ecstasies of this roller coaster ride we call everyday life. If you have this concept clearly in mind, I now put to you the idea that these, all these discarded bodies live on for a time in the same way a decaying corpse and its hair and fingernails, bacteria, DNA, etc. live on in physical bodies buried in your neighborhood cemetery. The only difference being these astral corpses remain somewhat animated for a period of time while the remaining energy still residually resident in their shell, completely decays. And like discarded shells or husks, these astral zombies are made of the heaviest stratum, or the, or the slowest and lowest frequencies of energy. They sink to the very lowest levels of the sea of consciousness, the area that is very close to the material plane. It's quite literally an astral graveyard. When we're tired and relaxed, we fall asleep and ride an express elevator directly to some pretty high levels of consciousness. Those whose environs are, are revealed in the metaphoric imagery as the dream sky into which we blissfully soar. But if something is burdening our minds and forcing us to slowly drag our, drag our sorry astral consciousness, kicking and screaming out of the physical body, and step by step of the, of the back stairs of consciousness, then the first place we slog on our way up is the lowest place in the upland, the graveyard. The dramatic terrors and ordeals that candidates of ancient mystery schools were required to undergo during their initiations illustrate this frightening yet ultimately harmless fact of spiritual life. Because this area is so close to the material plane and solid coordinates of waking space-time consciousness, the bodies that populate the cemetery of your threshold are literally those hanging around your neighborhood. That's why so many of these bad dream experiences seem to include situations dealing with neighborhood 
bad people who, to all dream appearances, are attempting to violate your home or your body or your loved ones. Nine out of ten of my terror of the threshold projections, I find myself trying to chase away neighborhood vandals or, and please forgive this, deranged homeless people who are attempting to get into my house. But in the metaphoric reality of this plane of consciousness, that's exactly what they are. Homeless bodies who are no longer animated by a living self. Drifting in obedience to the laws of cosmic osmosis toward the realm, my house, that is inhabited by an abundance of living. These astral zombies mean no harm. They mean nothing because there is no self inside to provide them with intent. But boy, they scare the living daylights out of you when you stumble into their world. A moment ago, I mentioned that I'm not very good at consciously entering an, into an out-of-body experience. I think I should probably rephrase that to say I'm not very good at consciously leaving my body unless I first gorged myself to near unconsciousness on my wife's spinach or broccoli quiche. I knew you were hoping I'd get around to that. It is with no small measure of embarrassment that I confess that even though I came of mystical age in the psychedelic 60s, even though I have at one time or another in my 62, well at the time, in my 75 years um, uh, on this planet, I've experimented with a cornucopia of mind-altering substances. Even though I've labored to control my breathing with pranayama, fasted for days on end, even though I've chanted myself to socially acceptable insanity and engaged in magical rituals that I would never dream of describing to your mother, the strongest and most powerful drug I have ever consciously ingested for the purpose of driving myself out of my physical body is Constance's homemade broccoli or spinach quiche. I must point out that this dish is not necessarily dangerous to anyone possessing a modicum of common sense and self-discipline. It is, however, it has, however, challenged the resolve of many strong-willed magician, and unless you've actually inhaled its savory perfume and laid eyes upon its fluffy, buxom filling spilling over the thick, flaky fringe of rich, shortbread crust, unless you've actually slipped a warm forkful of its buttery ambrosia into your watering mouth and felt the living soul of cream and butter and eggs and scallions spiced with nutmeg and a dozen other spices and Swiss parmesan and cheddar cheese explode in your mouth. Then, my friend, you have no right whatsoever to ridicule the weakness of others. It is a dish to die for. In fact, on one occasion, a dear friend of ours actually suffered a massive heart attack within a few hours of his feast of Constance's spinach quiche, an event that required immediate triple bypass surgery and months of recuperation. I'm happy to say he recovered completely and has assured us on numerous occasions that the experience was worth the memory of the quiche. Uh, as a digression, uh, that spinach quiche was served after his uh, one of his OTO initiations, too. So it was a double initiatory experience. And we ask him, is there anything that's off your diet or anything else? 
And he says, well, you know, well usually, but uh, I'm going to celebrate tonight. So, okay. But I digress. Is it any wonder that a weak-willed and insecure glutton such as myself succumbs to the demon succumbs to the demon of intemperance whenever I'm confronted with an entire spinach or broccoli quiche during a quiet dinner for two in the privacy of my own home? The particular out-of-body experience I'm about to relate took place five years ago, and well. This is now 17 years ago, something like that. Following one such quiet dinner, I must hasten to point out that at that time in my life, I had been abusing my body with a litany of bad eating and drinking habits, crimes against wisdom, and had allowed myself to grow to nearly 300 pounds. It was not good. I'm happy to say that since I've lost more than 100 pounds and I'm feeling better, than I have in my entire life. At the time, however, my weight made sleeping quite challenging. It was great for lucid dreaming and astral projection because I was often tossing and turning in that twilight world between waking and sleep. But it was terribly frightening when I realized that many of my colorful nocturnal adventures were kicked off by the suffocating effects of sleep apnea, and that my astral projections could probably be more accurately described as near-death experiences. Still, this season of my life was characterized by a rich assortment of out-of-body experiences and led to my ability to control and direct circumstances in my dreams and projections. I wish I could say that Constance was as, as excited about my astral adventures as I was, but I can't. In fact, they were often rude and terrifying interruptions to her sleep. She usually knows when I'm outside of my body before I do, because I almost always roll over on my back and stick my left arm straight up into the air. Yeah. I have no idea why I do this, but whenever I do, she wakes me up and grumbles to herself, oh no, he's out of his body again. I wonder, he, I wonder when he's going to make that noise. And I have to point out in the book, I have an ongoing dialogue uh, from things that Constance is thinking, and even a dialogue of what our cat is thinking during all of this. So. The noise that she dreads is a phenomenon that occurs when my astral body tries to speak, or rather when my physical vocal cords try to vibrate to the speech impulses coming from my astral body. When I open my astral mouth to say something, my physical mouth back in bed makes the most grotesque and hideously frightening noise. <laughs> sort of like that. It's very frustrating. I'm always going, and I'm trying to push the air out, thinking, thinking that the, the harder I, the harder I push the, the air out of my uh, physical body, the, the clearer, and I'm not scared or, or terrified or anything, but it sounds like I am, okay? It's not just a whimper, either. I let out a monstrous groan as if I were the most tortured soul in the deepest pit of hell. Very loud. I can hear myself do it and often wake up. It's so loud that Constance is sure our next-door neighbors must be terrified by the sound. I feel so embarrassed. I, I always think, why can't I speak? Why am I making these horrible noises? But instead of shutting up or trying to wake up, I always try again, only louder. Okay. 
That's when Constance has had enough and jabs me in the ribs with her elbow and yells in my ear, You're out of your body again. Wake up and go back to sleep. And put your arm down. I don't recall what the occasion was. Perhaps it was a birthday or anniversary or just one of those days Constance was careless enough to innocently ask me, What would you like to dinner for dinner tonight, dear? My answer, of course, was, Broccoli quiche please. And so to begin a day of heroic kitchen gymnastics, and so began a day of heroic kitchen gymnastics that would give birth to the mystical meal. The quiche itself is made in an oversized pastry dish, not a pie plate, that can easily serve a huge slice to six hungry people. It's not a thin little breakfast quiche either. The rich whipped filling fluffs up to nearly four inches. Two of these pieces was entirely too much for one sane person to eat in one sitting. But it was so good that I begged for another. Constance reluctantly agreed to and succumbed to the temptation of another slice herself. When we were finished, we'd eaten two-thirds of the massive pie. We were gorged and painfully uncomfortable. Constance began to serve her penance by cleaning up the kitchen and attacking the dishes. I moved to the computer and tried unsuccessfully to write. The remaining one-third of the quiche cooled on the kitchen counter. An hour later, we were both still groaning and hold, holding our bloated bellies. Of course, I had a much bigger burden. The quiche had cooled enough to be wrapped in plastic and put in the refrigerator, which is exactly what Constance was preparing to do when a spirit of gluttony most foul whispered in my ear and counseled me that tomorrow the quiche would not taste nearly as good as it does right now. It would be a waste, a sacrilege, a crime. Sated or not, we should eat the rest of the quiche before going to bed tonight, and that was that. Constance would have none of it, but she was too tired and full to argue with me. She went off to a hot bath, and I sat in the darkened living room and ate the rest of the broccoli quiche straight out of the baking dish. I went to bed, too full to stay awake, too full to fall asleep. Our cat, Luis, snuggled in his usual place, sandwiched but tightly between us. In a few minutes, I became too uncomfortable to remain in my physical body. I heard that crazy sound in the center of my head and felt the familiar electrical buzz. Then without further fanfare, I floated out of my body on a sickening wave of pure butter fat. I should point out the fact that I did indeed know that I was in a projection. I was extremely groggy and wanted very much just to fall asleep and make it all stop. It seems like I was heading toward that blissful realm when I heard a noise outside the front door. I rolled over to see if I could hear a bit better. And this is what Constance was thinking. Oh God, he was rolled over again. I hope he doesn't smash the cat. The cat was thinking, oh God, he's out of his body again. I, I think he's laying on my back legs. Yes, it was clear somebody was trying to get into the house. I rolled out of bed and quietly, quietly crept into the hallway. Constance thought, well, there goes his arm. He's out of his body. I'll get no sleep tonight. The cat thought, if he rolls over any farther, there won't be room for me. I tiptoed through the living room 
to the front door. I peered out the window in the door, completely ignoring the fact that there is no window in our front door, and saw three or four shadowy figures crouched on the doorstep. Suddenly I heard a noise behind me in the living room. One got in, I thought. I was right. I turned around. Constance was thinking, there he goes, rocking back and forth. And Luis the cat says, ouch, damn it, that hurts. Why doesn't he just die and let me sleep? I saw a shadow slip inside the large closet that forms the entire south side of our living room. Once inside the closet, the intruder slowly slid the door closed from the inside. It was a very spooky moment. Completely ignoring the fact that there is no closet in our living room, I stood still while I debated with myself what I should do. Constance was thinking, ah, at least he stopped rocking. I wonder if he's breathing. And the cat was snoring. It is at this point I get completely caught up in the action. Part of me knows I'm projecting and or in a dream, and part of me doesn't. I start to weigh my options as if there were a real intruder in the house, in the real house. I better be careful. Maybe I can somehow trap him in there and call the police. I don't have a gun or a knife or a club. What can I do? Then the thought hit me. I'm huge. I weigh 300 pounds. I can just fall on this bastard and crush him to a pulp. Constance was sleeping. The cat was sleeping. I march over to the closet door and violently slide it open. Cowering in a dark corner is a slimy lump of blackness that looks very much like the character Schmeagol or, or Gollum from The Lord of the Rings. I suddenly feel I have the power to terrorize this creature out of existence, or at least scare it out of my living room. I muster the most hideous face and swell my titanic bulk to monstrous stature, to assure that my voice will billow with the thunder of 10,000 volcanic devils, I suck in an enormous breath of air. Constance wakes and says, oh no, here it comes. Luis the cat said, God, he's blowing up. He's trying to crush me to death. And then I try to say, I'll crush you. Those were the words my astral body voice was trying to bellow, but all that could come out of my physical body back in bed was a blood curdling. Luis the cat then knew for sure I was trying to crush him to death. He clawed Constance, desperately trying to pull back his legs from under me, and when he was free, his feet did not touch the floor until he was well out of the bedroom. I had awakened fully, and the realization of what just happened struck me so funny that I began laughing hysterically. Constance says, maniacally. She told me I scared her to death, but her main concern was for our neighbors who must have heard and had the scare of their lives. We were both certain the police were on their way. What would be my defense? Quiche intoxication? Astral projection? Okay, the chapter goes on with, uh, you know, you're out of your body when. But anyway, I know I've gone way too long this morning. My phone is probably out of power even. So that's it for today. Okay, that's my spinach quiche story. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have even had a taste of spinach quiche if you've known us long enough. Constance hasn't made it in many years. But until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law.
Love is the law. Love under will.